Okay. We can get started now. Um, welcome to Math 1160. I'm sure it's you're the, the class you're most excited about this semester. So welcome, welcome. Um, uh, my name's actually, I guess we'll get to that in the, uh, in the uh, syllabus, but uh, my name's Trevor Johnson. I'm a grad student here at ISU. I'm getting a master's degree in mathematics right now. Um, and I should graduate if I can pass my written exam. I should graduate in May. And I actually already have a job lined up at Utah Tech University. So I'm going to be teaching down there once I'm done. So I'm really excited about that. Anyway, so, uh, but my background's teaching. I love teaching. I've been, I, before I came and got my master's degree, I was doing, I was teaching junior high and middle school. So I did that for about five years before coming here. Um, anyway, uh, so today we're going to go over the syllabus. Uh, you guys may have been looking for it on Moodle, and I just barely finished it uh, today, this morning, but I figure we go over the syllabus that first day of class anyway, so I, it didn't matter too much if you looked at it beforehand, because we're going to go over it anyway. Um, and then, but, but it's up now, so you can see it on Moodle, it's posted, so if you have any questions after this, or if you forgot stuff, you can go reference it on Moodle, um, whatever you want. Okay, so anyway, uh, Math 1160, Survey of Calculus. Um, this is a nice little abbreviated calculus class where we go into differential and integral calculus, and it's designed primarily for students in the biological sciences, business, education, humanities, although at this point, it's pretty much all, mostly, almost all biology students, right? Raise your hand if you're a biology major. Yeah, raise your hand if you're not. <laughs> uh, what's your major? Pharmacy. Pharmacy, okay, cool. Um, Pharmacy. 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 Okay. Okay. So <laughs> pharmacy or biology. Uh, but yeah, it used to like when I was, when they were talking to me about this class, it used to like do business majors and all this other kind of stuff. And it's just kind of narrowed down to just, just you guys. So we're going to do a lot of biology applications. Um, we're going to talk about like drug concentration and population growth and stuff like that. Um, uh, and we'll stay away from like money applications because that's boring. So um, uh, you're in the right place. I've got my meeting times here. Um, I guess unless so far this intro has really confused you because you thought you're in a different class, then you're not in the right place. But uh, I, this is really for people who are not here today and got lost. Um, okay, so our course objectives, the, the big things that we're going to be going over today, or not, no, not today, uh, over the course of this semester, uh, is first off, we're going to, we're going to get really comfortable with functions, lots of different types of functions, so, so we want to make sure that by the end of this class, and mostly by the end of this first unit, you're really comfortable working with exponential functions, power functions, logarithmic functions, um, and just really any functions and all the different ways we represent functions, which is going to be a big part of what we talk about today. Um, uh, and then we're going to talk about limits, okay? So uh, we want to make sure that by the end of this course that you guys can confidently make use of mathematical limits and limit notation. Uh, you need to be able to express values as limits and then evaluate the limits of functions um, using algebra or analyzing graphs. Okay, limits are important because limit, limits lead us directly into these uh, two kind of core pillars of calculus, okay? Uh, there's really two, uh, if you think about basic calculus, calculus one, I guess, 
no, I guess there's, cal well, okay. If you think about basic calculus, like 100 level calculus, right? Um, it, you can really be divided into two different types, differential calculus, which works with derivatives and integral calculus, which works with integrals, okay? And so we're gonna cover both of those because this is just kind of a, a, a summary class. We're gonna hit kind of the basics of both of these, okay? Both of them are related to limits, but both of these, by the end of the semester, you should be comfortable with the basics of, of each of these. So the basics of derivatives, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to take the derivative or differentiate just basic functions, uh, use different rules effectively in order to differentiate more complicated functions. And then we're, of course, going to be solving applications using differentiation. And then similarly, with integrals, we're going to be solving applications using integrals. We're going to be able to integrate very simple functions. Uh, we're going to we're going to be using calculators to, to kind of do the more complex functions. And then kind of and then this right here is just we're going to understand where integrals come from. OK, so that's the whole Riemann integral idea. OK, and that's going to be so this is chapter one, really. This is chapter two. Limits is chapter two. Chapter three and four is all about derivatives. And then chapter five and six is all about integrals. Okay. Okay. Um, there's me. Uh, so there's my email, Trevor Johnson too. I guess I'm not the first Trevor Johnson to attend ISU. Um, and then my office is just here on this floor because this is where all the math stuff happens. So if you just go down this hallway, there's the big main hallway that cuts across right by where the two like stairwells are. And then right after that, there's a tiny little hallway that has five different offices in it where all of us grad students get to uh, huddle in together. So, so I'm just in 323E. So that's where I'll be during office hours. So you can come in and meet with me there, or you can meet with me through Zoom, which we'll talk about once I get to office hours. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Okay. So grading. Uh, so there's kind of five different parts to your final grade. First off, there's homework. We will be doing homework a bunch, right? Because it gives you that chance to get that individual practice. Make sure that you can do it individually. Um, and homework also lets you extend what we learn in class. Because we can only cover so much in class, right? So homework gives you the chance to take what we learn and extend it to more kind of complicated problems. So you'll see both of those in your homework, homework problems that help you just practice and homework problems that help you extend your knowledge, okay? Um, I will assign homework after class every day, okay? Usually that's, I don't know, seven to 10 problems. Um, so every Tuesday and Thursday, I will assign uh, homework after class. You won't see it before class. So I usually wait till I see what we actually went through in class to assign it. And then that, uh, but homework's due once a week, okay? So the homework that I assign on Tuesday and Thursday will kind of get lumped in together to one assignment. And you'll turn that in on Moodle on Tuesday evenings, okay? So um, questions about that? Yes. Is it going to be like you're going to give us a PDF or something on Moodle and then we write it out, or is it like do a program? So, uh, yes, yeah, so what it'll be is I, um, uh, I'll just assign problems in the book, right? And so you'll just do that on your own sheet of paper, or you can do it just like, I don't know, if you have like an iPad or something, you can do it on a file and some drawing app or whatever, whatever uh, works best for you. But then what you'll do is you'll, you'll, either take a picture, if it's a physical piece of paper, you'll take a picture of that and then submit it on Moodle. So that's how you do it. Or if you have a file that you did it on, you'll just submit that file to Moodle, okay? Uh, yes? My last uh, math class, we used CamScanner, would that work? Yeah, CamScanner works great. So yeah, so if you don't have a piece of paper, just CamScan it, because that puts it as a PDF, and then you'll upload that PDF. Yeah, that works perfect, okay? And in fact, there are, you have to be careful with like, there are a few files that get kind of screwy when you kind of uh, upload it to Moodle. So I think if you do it on an iPad with like a certain app, it, it saves it as an HEIC file or something like that. And HEIC files are not okay because when I, I have to like download them individually anytime someone does that in order for me to actually see them. 
So if you have questions about whether a file is going to work, please talk to me. But in general, JPEGs, PDFs are just fine. Okay. Um, other questions? Okay. Um, homeworks. Uh, oh, we'll get to that. Okay, we'll get to that later. Um, and so in total, because uh, it's going to be both the Tuesday and Thursday homework, in total, these homework assignments, these weekly homework assignments are about 15 to 20 questions, okay? Okay, 15% of your grade is also quizzes, okay? Quizzes will, will happen each week on Thursdays, just at the end of class, last 15 minutes of class. These quizzes are just one question, and it's just a quick little knowledge check to make sure that you kind of understood what we talked about that week, Okay. Uh, that question is taken from a, an exam from like last semester. And so that's kind of the whole point of these is, first of all, to check your understanding things, but also to give you guys a chance to see what exam problems look like. Okay, so you get to practice those exam problems. And I grade these a lot more uh, leniently than I do on exams. With these quizzes, because it's just a knowledge check to make sure you know what's, uh, what you're doing, uh, at least half of the grade is going to be just participation. As long as you're here and complete it, you're going to get at least 50%. And that can go up if I give you guys a, this happened a few times last semester, where if I give you guys a quiz and we did not cover it well enough and we struggle on it at like together as a class, right? And in that case, I'll bump that up to like 80 or 90% completion and I'll grade you on accuracy for like the last little bit. Does that make sense? So I want these quizzes to be low stress but to give you practice with exam type questions, okay? Um, okay, and that's every Thursday, last 15 minutes of class. Um, if you, I haven't received any emails, but I've had this happen in the past. If you are, are one of those people that need extra time for quizzes or things like that, like if you could work through the disability services and things like that for extra time, uh, please just talk to me and we'll work something out. For, for how to make that work, okay? And then, okay, and so then we get into the exam. So 20% is gonna be your first exam, which covers chapter one and two, and that'll be about the fifth week of class, okay? And so this one will be all about just basic functions and then limits, okay? Exam two is, uh, so that's gonna happen about the 11th week of class, because we need a little bit more time for chapters three and four. This will cover chapters three and four. Um, and this is, and this just covers chapter three and four. It's not going to go back and talk about chapters one and two at all. Okay. And so this one's going to be all about derivatives, this exam two. Um, and then for these weeks that have exams on them, you won't get homework and you won't get quizzes, of course, because I want you to just focus on anything. Um, and then your final is 30%. It's comprehensive. So it'll cover everything. Um, it'll kind of, put a focus on chapter five and six, because that's what you haven't been uh, tested on yet. So like maybe half the questions will be chapter five and six and the other half will be uh, all previous stuff, okay? And it'll be in person. All of these finals are in person, or sorry, all of these exams are in person and this one will just happen during finals week. So, questions about grading, yes? So I have a question about the course in general. So yeah. Comes, you mentioned calculators earlier. Is there a calculator that you suggest for this class? Yeah, good question. So we really won't, um, I don't, uh, you don't need a graphing calculator, okay? And there's gonna be a few cases where, uh, there's gonna actually probably a lot of cases where I say don't use, if you have a graphing calculator, don't use the graphing capability. Because a lot of times, uh, if, you, if you can just graph it, 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 it kind of circumvents a lot of the work we do. And so uh, you don't need a graphing calculator. If you have one, you can use it. Uh, scientific calculator works just fine. Uh, for if you're working on homework or if you're working on just like, uh, if you're like doing stuff in class, uh, your phone's fine. But when it comes to like quizzes and exams, uh, I prefer to actually use a calculator so I don't have to worry about you looking stuff up on your phone or things like that. Um, so yeah, just a basic scientific calculator works. Um, Good question. Um, if we do go into graphing, which I think there's a couple of topics where I want to get into graphing, uh, don't bother getting a graphing calculator because there's plenty of uh, awesome websites that kind of do it for you. So like Wolfram Alpha or Desmos, right? 
those are two great websites that I'll I'll use it like I'll use in class and you can use at home rather than by graph and calculate. So uh, other questions? Yeah. Um well, you gotta wait for that one. That one's coming up. <laughs> so anyway. Uh okay, let's move on. Okay, so class format and attendance. So this is an in-person class. Um, we've done I've done hybrid in the in, in the past, um, but I I, I, re I really prefer in person because uh, uh, you're more successful. I've experienced this firsthand. You're more successful when you come to class. Okay, when you're here in person. So uh, it's I'm not going to have it. It's not going to be part of your grade, obviously. But I still, uh, I still want you here. Um, of course, if you're sick or if you have extenuating circumstances, I understand, right? So if you cannot be here for any reason, please notify me beforehand. And I will, uh, like I kind of mentioned right at the beginning, I'm going to record these lectures every single day or every single class period. Um, so if you are going to miss class for any reason, let me know beforehand and I will give you the zoom link if you're sick I can give you the zoom link so that you can follow along just from home uh, but if you're going to miss class altogether then I can give you these recorded lectures for you to watch okay um, and then say and then if it's a quiz day like if it's a, if it's a Thursday then if you know you're gonna miss class you can tell me beforehand and I will send you just like an electronic copy that you can print out and complete at home and then email me when you're done okay um, so that's so that's also possible. Um, but if you don't let me know, then you're responsible for all those things, and uh, it's it's up to you to kind of make those up. I, I if you don't let me know beforehand, I, I don't allow quiz makes up make make makeups. Okay. So you, so if you want access to a quiz, if you know you're going to miss a Thursday, you have to let me know before. Yeah. Um, in the past, I've had professors that put their recorded lectures on a playlist, and some that you have to ask for each individual one um, okay is there a playlist or is it going to be on yeah yeah so uh what i've done in the past is uh i i want to record the lectures just as a study tool for you later on so what i'll usually do is probably a week or two before the exam i'll just i'll put all the recorded lectures up on google i told you on the past so um so that uh, uh so that there's still a study tool but um i don't i don't want them readily available to make it easy for people to skip class. So, um, other questions? Yeah. So once again, successful students attend class. So please make it a priority to be here. Um, okay, so office hours. So uh, like I said, my office is just down the corner or down, down the hall. Uh, I will be there whenever we have office hours, uh, but I'll also broadcast it over Zoom so you can join via Zoom. So my two scheduled office hours are Monday from two to three, okay. And and what's nice about this one is that's you know a day before your homework's due. So it's a good time if you have questions as you work through your homework over the weekend. That's a good time for you to come in and get help on any homework questions you have. And then Thursday from one to two, okay. So those are my two office hours times where I'll be in my office. Um, I also though just finished scheduling this room for the hour before our class. Uh, I don't have a parking pass, which means I have to get here with plenty of time to find a parking spot. Uh, and so I will always try and be here 30 minutes to an hour early. Um, and, and so feel free to come to class early if you, if that's an option for you. And same thing, you can ask me questions, we can go over homework problems, anything like that, just before class. So, so I have these two scheduled office hours and that hour before class every Tuesday and Thursday. Okay. If none of those times work for you, please let me know and we can figure something else out. Okay. Uh, okay. Question. Um, okay. Awesome. Uh, I also on Moodle, I've actually already put like uh, links to these as well. So you should see those. So you don't have to like open up the syllabus every time you want the Zoom links. Those are right on the middle too. Um, okay. 
here's the textbook. And this was recently changed just last semester. So this is kind of, this is still kind of new. Um, and the reason why is uh, the one before was just kind of a general uh, calculus textbook, where this one is very focused on uh, biology applications, but, uh, hence biocalculus. Okay, so uh, I like it uh, from using it last year, although it was a little rough last semester with me kind of uh, adjusting to the new textbook. Uh, but I've got a little bit more experience in it now, so hopefully it'll be a little smoother. Um, if you do not have it yet, for maybe the first two weeks, I'll just I'll post pictures of the homework problems, but I don't want to have to do that the whole semester. So please make sure you get it just for in these next two weeks if you don't already have it. I have the PDF version of it. Do you want me to send it to you to share? Of, of this book? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Uh, do you, is it the right edition? Yes. Cool. Yeah, send it to me. And I'll share it out. Um uh I I you know it's just the uh yeah, I'll 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 double check because the big thing is just to make sure that the homework problems are all the same. Yeah. So uh so I'll double check that and make sure it works and then I'll send it out if it does. Um okay. Uh, final thoughts. These are all kind of the things that you see in a lot of the syllabuses. Um, uh, teaching matters. So if you have any complaints or concerns about teaching, you can talk to the math department chair. So that's all of his contact information. Uh, everyone is welcome. This is all about disability services and how we want to make it work for everybody. So if you have any of these issues, go talk to those services and we'll make it work. Um, and then. Honesty is the best policy, um, yada, yada. Please be honest in this class. Um, and then academic freedom and responsibility. So, um, questions about this class, about the syllabus, about me, about anything. Um, last, or last year when I was doing the kind of hybrid class, I did everything under the doc cam. But last semester I switched on the board because I just prefer going being on the board. Um, I think it I think it's a little bit more dynamic and helps us. I don't know. It felt weird just sitting the whole time. But this only has a chalkboard. So if you hate the sound of chalk on the chalkboard, get out now. I guess I don't know. I don't have much of a say in uh, you know, like getting a whiteboard in this room. So um, yeah, questions, questions, questions. Okay. Awesome. Well, let's get started. So, yeah. turn this off. Turn this off. Turn this off. Turn this off. Oh. Okay. So, because of the, because I'm recording this on Zoom and I'm using that owl thing, I will probably just use this board, and I'll just be constantly erasing. So I apologize for you guys; you get have to look a little farther. Um, let's switch this over. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh, to start today, we're going to start right at, you know, the, the basics, basics, uh, to make sure we have a nice, strong foundation as we move forward, okay? So we're going to start with functions, and I know functions is probably something you guys have learned about in previous math classes. I think you start talking about functions back in, ugh, I don't know, eighth grade, maybe, seventh or eighth grade. So, uh, so functions are, you know, it's something we've heard about before. Um, but the reason why this is where we're going back to is because in order to succeed in class, everything we look at in this class is functions, right? And so we need to be very comfortable with functions, how they work, notation, all that kind of stuff in order to really uh, be able to succeed as we go, as we move further on. So this is 1.1, the title of this section is four ways to a function. Okay. Uh, 
My handwriting on a piece of paper is absolutely terrible. My handwriting on a whiteboard isn't too bad. We'll see where uh, we'll see where my handwriting is on chalkboard. Um, okay. Um, so a function is a mathematical rule um, that relates or assigns exactly one output value, I guess we value there, uh, that relates or assigns exactly one output value in a certain range Okay, I'm not underlining this because we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Um, in a certain range to a given input uh, in a certain in a certain domain. Okay, so there's another kind of big word that we're going to uh, define in just a little bit. Okay. So that's kind of the uh, big word definition of what a function is. Um, but if we want to think about like what this actually means, a good example of a function is like a vending machine, right? Um, a vending machine uh, takes uh, or assigns an output um, to uh, get an input. Okay, Your output is what soda comes out and your input is what button you push, right? So each input is assigned exactly one output. Okay. This is important. This exactly one output idea is important because if you have a vending machine and you press a button and it pops out a Coke, and then you press, a bu press the same button and it pops out a Sprite, that vending machine is broken, right? It's not working properly if you, can't, if you don't actually know what's going to come out if you press the same button, right? So that's an important thing to recognize with a function, right? Uh, if I have a give, if I input a value, there's only one value that's going to come out from that. Okay. So, um, questions about that? About this definition? And, and once again, we you, hopefully you guys have worked with functions a lot. Okay. Um, and so this definition of a function hopefully isn't anything too new. Um, but. Let's define these two terms. Okay. This word range really just represents all possible outputs. So if I go back to my vending machine um, analogy, the, the range is just all of the different sodas that are in your vending machine. Right. All those are all your possible things that can be that can come out of this menu. Okay. Um, your domain is just all your possible inputs. Okay. So uh, for your vending machine, your domain is just all the different buttons you can press. Or for these newfangled vending machines with like the number combinations it's all the possible number combinations here okay so that's what the domain is right? and we'll see what that looks like when we get to like mathematical examples. okay so um so the reason why functions are so important in math okay is um in mathematics we use functions to relate uh, two quantities that depend on each other. Okay, uh, mathematics. We study a lot of these, a lot of these relationships between between quantities, um, uh, and and we use these functions to show how one quantity depends on the other. Okay, so um, Functions are used 
to relate two quantities that depend um, on each other. Okay. Okay, so let's let's think about some examples of quantities that depend on each other, right? That we could use a function to actually relate it to. Um, so some examples are yeah, yeah, yeah. Examples are um, the area of a circle. Okay. and the radius of the circle, okay? Those are two quantities that directly relate to each other, right? Um, the area of the circle depends on what the radius is, and the radius of the circle depends on what the area is, okay? Um, the population of the world, or population of the world, okay? And um, uh, the year, okay? Those are two quantities that will, or that depend on each other, okay? and relate to each other, okay? Uh, and then I'm running out of room. Uh, the cost. Uh, we'll we'll simplify this one. Uh, here I'll just I'm gonna erase that. Okay, the cost to mail an envelope and uh, the weight of the contents of the envelope. Okay, those are two quantities that depend on each other. Okay, okay, but with all of uh, well, I guess, but if we think about this word depend. It's, it's actually more helpful for us, instead of just saying, oh yeah, these depend on each other, it's more helpful to think which one depends on the other one. Which one depends on the other one? Uh, let's start over here. Which one depends on which? Does cost depend on the weight or does weight depend on the cost? Cost depends on the weight. Yeah, cost depends on weight. You guys agree? Okay. So, um, Um, uh, absolutely correct. And but uh, for those who might be thinking, but well, well, why? But well, why? Well, one one thing you think, or does anybody have a good explanation why? 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 Why does cost depend on weight, not the other way around? Cost the more to ship it, it's heavier. Okay, right. Um, but couldn't I reverse that and say, uh, well, it's going to be heavier if the cost is higher, right? So why 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 are we choosing it this way? Why does the cost come on weight? You put the weight in, the weight would be the input, and then based on that weight, you they give you a cost instead of them you giving them a cost and then them weighing out your cost. Right. The weight is more what we have control over, right? So that's one way you can think about it, right? I can control uh, the amount of weight I put in. So it's um, it's something we have control over rather than the cost. Okay. Um, Let's move on. Population and whatever years. Okay. Which one depends on which? Population depends on the year. You're absolutely right. Why? Um, well, the year just kind of happens. Yes. And this the population is always changing, so you need to know what year the population you're talking about. Okay, yeah, I like it. Now, let's be clear. I'm just shortening population. Yes, pop music depends on the year as well, but we're talking about population. Um, but I, I will say that this kind of argument that we talked about here doesn't really apply here, because we don't really have control of the population, and we don't have control of the year, right? But it is easy to say, well, yeah, the population depends on what year it is. But couldn't I reverse that, right? The year depends on what the population is. 
So here's another way we can tell which one depends on the other, okay? Could I theoretically have the same population for two different years? Yeah, right? I mean, we don't expect that to happen anytime soon unless some sort of apocalyptic event happens, right? But that it's theoretically possible. I could have the same population for two different years, okay? Um, if my population goes up and then goes back down. But if I switch that, could I have the same population for two different, or no, no, wait, could I have two different populations for the same year? Okay, and, and you might be thinking, oh, well, beginning of the year, end of the year, but if, um, but if I switch year to like time, think about it in terms of time, can I have two different populations at the same time? No, right? And so that goes back to this idea where a function has to assign exactly one output to, to the given input. So that tells me that the input here is, is the years or the time, okay? And you're gonna see, we're gonna, we're gonna do lots of applications where we're working with time and time is like 99%. It's 99% of the time, it's your input. Okay, it's your input. The, the other value depends on the time. Okay. okay. Um, awesome. And we can actually go back and use that same logic here. Could I theoretically have uh, two different weight amounts that give me the same cost? Yeah, right. In fact, I think I think that's how the postal service works, right? As long as your weight's within a certain range, it's a fixed cost. So I could have like 12.2 ounces and 12.4 ounces, and it's going to be the same cost. But I can't do it the other way because I can't have two different costs for the same weight, right? So that tells me that weight has to be my input. Okay. Last. Which one depends on which? A circle depends on the radius. How do the area and by the distance? Ah, ah, I love it. So this is a very interesting case because if I use the logic we have been using, can I have two areas for the same radius? No. Can I have two radiuses for the same area? No. So neither of those are possible. So I honestly could have it either way. I could have this one be the input or I could have this one be the input. But the way we're used to seeing the area formula, right, is like this. And if I write it this way, this is inferring that my area depends on the radius, okay? And we're actually going to get to this in a little bit. Okay, so we're going to talk about equations and, uh, a little bit later on where we'll talk about that notation and how that works. Um, so you're absolutely right. That's, that's conventionally how we think about it, but this is an interesting one where you could do it either way. Um, okay, so this, what this does, this kind of um, logic that we've been working through here introduces two kind of, uh, uh, introduces are these new terms right here. So the independent variable and the dependent variable. Okay. So when I'm when I'm using a function to relate two quantities that depend on each other, right? If one depends on the other, then we have this relationship where one variable is dependent on the other, and then the other one's independent. Okay, so that's this idea of independent variables and out, uh, dependent variables. I'm not actually going to define these because it's pretty. Uh, ex the 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 words I'm using in the in the titles it makes it pretty self-explanatory of what's going on here. Okay, um, but if I relate it to the the terminology I was using here, my independent variable becomes my input, okay? 
Because like going back to this one, because the cost depended on the weight and that we could control what the, the weight of the weight value. And so that became my input. That's the, that's the thing that I can actually plug in. Okay. So my independent variable is my input and my dependent variable is my output. Because okay. it depends on whatever input you plug in. Okay. Questions up to this point. Okay, so just kind of going through the basics of functions, but so far we've kind of talked about we, where we, we run into four kind of major terms. I guess input and output is pretty major too. I'm going to be using that terminology a lot throughout the semester. Okay. Um, Okay, since I'm only using this one, I will be erasing pretty frequently. Yeah, okay, if I erase this. Let me say no. Okay, so now let's actually get to the title of the uh, uh, the title of the section. Uh, there's four ways in mathematics that we traditionally represent these these functions, right? These, these relationships between two quantities, okay? First is everyone's favorite is verbally, okay? Which just boils down to word problems. Right? This is where we have a man that 40 watermelons is selling or buying 50 more. Anyway, um, so uh, we're going to see lots of these because that's, you know, if we're going to be doing lots of application of this biology applications that boils down to you're going to get some verbal explanations of what's going on. You have to then convert into a mathematical function, right? You have to recognize it's a mathematical, or mathematical function, okay? So let's, um, so the, the toughest thing with these verbally ones is recognizing which quantity is which. Or first of all, is recognizing what quantities that I'm working with, and then being able to tell which one's the independent variable, which one's the dependent variable. So let's 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 look at it. Let's look at an example here. Um, we have a situation uh, where we're uh, measuring the temperature of water um, running. From a hot water faucet, okay, over a period of time. Okay, so here's my here's my kind of here's my work problem, okay. And this one, I'm specifically not really giving you any, or not giving you any verbal clues of which one's your independent variable and which one's your dependent variable. Sometimes the way they word it, it's it's very clear which one's which. But sometimes they like, use the word depends in the in the word problem, and that makes it pretty clear which one's which. But in this case, nothing's telling me which one's uh, dependent, which one's independent. So we got to figure it out. First off, what two quantities am I relating? Temperature and time. Temperature and time, right? The temperature, I'm, 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 I'm looking at temperature, I'm gonna use capital T, and it's over a specific period of time. I'm gonna use lowercase t for, for time, okay? So now that we know what our two quantities are, um, which one's independent, which one's dependent? Temperature's independent. Temperature's independent, why? Because it's um, constantly changing over time, times constant change. Okay, so it is so temperature is going to be constantly changing over time. Okay, but that tells me the time depends on what the temperature is. Well, the temperature depends on how long the water is. Okay, so that switches it. If you're saying the temperature depends on how long the water the, the water's been flowing, then that means temperature is dependent, right? Or dependent and time is independent. Which one do we think? Yeah. Time's independent, temperature's deep, or yeah, time's independent, temperature's dependent. 
Well, remember, if, if I want to check, let's think about it. Can I have, can I theoretically have the same temperature at two different times? Yeah, that's okay. Can I theoretically have two different temperatures at the same time? No. So that tells me time has to be my input. So time has to be my input. So absolutely, temperature depends on um, the time. So this is my, this becomes my input. And this becomes my. Okay. Very nice. So if it doesn't tell you specifically which one's dependent, which one's independent, you can kind of use this logic to kind of help figure that out. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it'll say, like, I think I actually, I actually changed the wording to make it a little bit more uh, thought provoking. Because initially when I was kind of looking for examples, the book said, temperature depends on time. Well, that makes it very obvious, right? Temperature depends on time. That means temperature is dependent. Okay. Another the other the other wording you might hear is um, blank, whatever quantity we're working with, is a function of the other quantity. So one quantity is a function of the other quantity. Written like this, um, we'll just call this A and this B. Um, which one's my dependent variable? Which one's my independent variable? Which one's dependent? A. a, yeah. A, a is what this this kind of this wording of is a function of is just another way to say it depends on. Okay. So A is a function of B that telling me that A depends on B. Okay, so A is my dependent, B is my independent. Okay. okay. So we're going to be looking at lots of word problems in this class. We're going to be looking at verbal representation a lot. Okay. But this leads us into the next representation. The next way we can represent a function is visually. Okay. But visually, I'm really just talking about a graph. Okay, we we do lots of graphs in math, right? Look at lots of different graphs, and, and honestly, because it's a really really convenient way to look at a function. Okay? If we can see visually what is that what it actually does. So let's go back to this example, and let's try and draw a graph. Okay. Um. Here's my basic coordinate grid that you guys have been working with since middle school, right? Or maybe even elementary school. What does my, what does this horizontal axis represent? My X is which are my inputs to my functions, right? If I just put X, you may not know exactly what that means, but, but thinking, going back to that basic mathematics, X is traditionally my input, right? So in this case, I don't want to put X. If I'm talking about this situation, what should I put? Or KC, right? That's my that's that's my variable for my input. Okay. So lowercase T is my horizontal axis. And then my vertical axis is going to represent my output. Um, normally, with my coordinate grid, that's y, right? Y is traditionally your output, but in this case, I have a different variable for my output. So this becomes my capital. Okay. Um, so, well, yeah, what would my graph look like? Take like 30, or, I don't know, 20 seconds? Take like 20 seconds and see if you can kind of try and visualize what the graph of this hot water faucet would look like. Okay, anybody want to come give it a shot? Yeah, come on. Um, Actually, that's not going to work. 
I'll see my like next semester. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Okay, I like it. I like it. So, um, if we're talking about temperature running from a hot water faucet over a period of time. So, why is his graph starting low? Or actually, we'll, we'll start even simpler than that. Why did he not put anything over here? Negative time. Yeah, we don't we don't work with negative time. Okay, we understand that time travel has not been discovered yet, so we don't work with negative time. So I don't actually need this part of the graph. Okay, what about down here? What would this represent? Negative, negative degree temperature of water, which is probably problematic if that's coming out of your faucet. So we really don't need that either. But that actually, but that makes more sense than negative time. Um, but okay, so uh, so so we don't need this part. We don't work the negative time. So this this time right here, right right where the axis is crossed represents zero. So in terms of my problem, that represents when or what? The faucet turned, turned on. The start of my observation. So I turn on the faucet right here. So why did he start at low? Yeah. Unless you got a killer water heater, <laughs> your water is going to start cooler than, and then. Right, right. The water in the pipe cools down, and so the first water that comes out is, is room temperature, and then and then it takes a while for the hot water to get there. Right. Um, and depending on how close your faucet is to the water heater, this could end up being, you know, stay cold for longer, or it could get hot quicker. Okay. What does that represent? It's going to get hotter for forever. It's going to get hotter for forever. Uh, remember, this is temperature. So that arrow is telling me that if this is my correct graph, as time goes on, my temperature reaches an infinite number of degrees. <laughs> oh, goodness. I don't, this is a scary water faucet. <laughs> okay, so could we adjust this to make it a little bit more accurate? How? It would plateau out, right? Because the, the water, the hot water faucet is going to reach uh, uh, kind of a terminal temperature value, right? Where it's not going to get any hotter because the hot water heater can only do so much, okay? Now, what's going to happen after that? After it plateaus, what happens? Eventually, you're going to run out of hot water. Uh, you're basically going to run out of hot water. So how, how can I finish this graph? Yeah, I could have it just kind of gradually go back down as it runs out of hot water. I like it. I like it. Okay. Um, okay. So, but what this graph does is it lets us visually uh, see what's happening with this um, with this function. Okay. What I can do is I can pick any input value I want. So I could pick this value right here that could maybe represent three seconds. Okay, and what does the graph do for me? It represents my data. So if I look at that specific point, I can come up here, find that point on the graph that matches with three seconds, and that will give me the corresponding temperature value when it's, when it's three seconds. So this graph, this line here, gives me all the corresponding outputs for whatever input I want to look at. Questions about graphs? We're gonna be looking. Uh, we're gonna be working a lot with graphs. Um, okay, next. Uh, the next way we can look at when they cut off some of that. Next way we can look at functions is numerically. I probably should capitalize that. Numerically. Right? What am I talking about when I say numerically? I'm talking about a table. Okay? We see tables, a lot of mathematics. Okay? Um, tables are nice because it, they're a very, very straightforward way of showing you how quantities relate. Okay? So um, this is how we're kind of used to seeing tables where... Oh, 
okay, where it just lists out different x values and different y values, and and this tells me that one, the input one corresponds to the output five, right? Five is the output that's been assigned to my input of one. Okay, negative seven is the output that's been assigned to my input of two. Okay, so very straightforward way of of just giving you those relationships between the input and the output. Okay, and uh, of course, if I write like this, it's more obvious X is my input, Y is my output, because X is traditionally my independent variable and Y is traditionally my uh, dependent variable. But if I didn't do that, right? If I just gave you like A and, I don't know, capital B, I don't know. Um, which one would be my independent? Which one would be my dependent? There's no context to help you out with this. So it's all boils down to just convention. The one on the left is your input. The one on your right is your, your output, okay? That's how tables, uh, how mathematicians have agreed for tables to work. Left is input, right is output. Now, of course, sometimes they throw out the window by putting the stuff on top of each other, right? Um, so if those are my two, if, if so if you see a table like that, R and X, oh, I, oh X has to be the input, right? Uh, with with tables, the, the value on top is your input, value on bottom is your output. So input. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Um so tables are interesting because it only gives us a certain amount of data, okay? And so we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit, uh, if we have, which we should have. Okay, last but not least, um, the fourth way that we can describe functions or represent function is through, is algebraically. Algebraically. Okay, which just boils down to an equation. Then you have to write an equation. Okay. And normally this this way to, to represent a function is only possible if there's a pattern to this relationship between the two quantities. If there's a pattern to that to that relationship, then we can use an equation. If I'm working with something like this, like the temperature and the time. That that shape of that graph is very very well. It's not it's not like a normal shape for like a normal equation, and so we may not actually be able to write an equation for that example. But if it has a nice discernible pattern, then a lot of the times we can create an equation for it. Okay. So um, conventionally, when I write equations, if I go back to my uh, my area for a circle, right. When I write it like this, the variable that is all by itself on one side is conventionally my output, right? Because it depends on what we input here, okay? Um, but the, 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 the place where it might be confusing with uh, equations is if I didn't know what pi was, right? If I didn't recognize that pi was a set number, I might think, oh, well, that's a variable too, right? So which one's my input? I've got two things that aren't numbers here. Which one's my actual input variable? And so that's why they've that's why uh, mathematicians introduce what's called function notation. Okay. So function notation makes it very uh, uh, easy to see which one's my actual. Um, variable. So like, for example, here, this is kind of the standard standard form for a quadratic function. Okay. And I have lots of different variables here. I have A, B, C, and X. But because I wrote it like this, this function notation, um, my function notation lets me know that X is my input. Okay. So this is function notation right here, F of X. What this is saying is my output is a function, f represents this function. Uh, f is actually considered the name of the function. So you, it doesn't have to be f. 
You could also see the letter G. Traditionally, G is used as well, and H, those are traditional letters used for function. So this is considered the name of the function. And this is telling me that my output is a function of this specific input. Okay, so f of x is my output. That whole thing represents my output. And whatever's inside that parentheses tells me what my input, what my input is. Okay. So we're going to use function notation all over the place in this class. So um, we need to make sure that we are very comfortable with function notation as we kind of move forward. Okay. Um, let's see. So let's talk about function notation just for a little bit more. Okay. So if this is my function f of x, what would what would that represent? Yeah, so that really just tells me my input now is going to be the value five. Okay. So so anywhere I had my input earlier, I'm going to replace that input with five. Okay. So if I'm using the same function, right? F, if I'm using the function f, this is my function f. This is going to be a times 25 plus b times five plus c. Okay. 25 just comes from x squared, right? So if I plug in 5, 5 squared is 25. Okay. What if I did something like this? What would f of x plus h represent? What if I put something more complicated into those parentheses? You'd still have to put the x plus h and the a parentheses x plus h plus b. And then yeah, so but so same idea, right? Same idea. I just wherever my input was earlier, I'm going to change that input value to now whatever's inside that parentheses. So I'm going to change all of these x's to this expression x plus h. So this would look like a times x plus h squared plus b times x plus h plus c. So everywhere I saw, I see that X, I see my input, I'm replacing it with what my new input is. Okay. So there's some simple practice with function notation. Okay. Um, over here, so, so now that we have kind of seen function notation, um, let's relate function notation to my, uh, my, hot water faucet, okay? So what I could do here is say, capital T, the temperature, since, since it depends on how much time has passed, I could say this is a function of time. It's a simple way to write. Um, I don't know the equation for it, so that's as far as I can go. But I can say that the temperature is a function of the time. If I come over here to the table, let's call this function. This is my, let's call this my, actually, let's just, since, since this f of x part represents the output, I'm going to replace y with d of x. Okay. This time I'm using g to represent my function. So G represents my function. And so G of X represents the output. Okay. So what is G of three equal to? Nine, because notice what's inside the parentheses. Okay. Previously, you know, normally what's inside the parentheses is whatever the input is. Right? That's what's inside the parentheses. So if I replace that with three, that means I'm looking at what's my output when my input is three. And in this case, it's nine. Okay. So that's another kind of uh, important way to, uh, important uh, way to, or uh, important understanding of how function notation works. Okay. So this right here 
represents what's my output when my input is this specific value. What's my output when my input is this specific value? Okay. Uh, okay, the last thing we need to talk about today, before we call it good, um, is kind of goes back to this idea that I introduced with tables. Tables are a very straightforward way to, to show that relationship between an input and an output or an independent variable and a dependent variable. But it's very limited because I only have a certain number of inputs. And I only have the corresponding outputs for those inputs. I don't have any other information. Okay. Well, this idea is called... Um, um, so this introduces this idea of discrete functions or continuous functions. Okay. So last piece of vocabulary that we're going to go over today. Okay, I'm going to erase this graph. Okay. So so I can have it. I can have discrete functions and I can have continuous functions. Now, let's be clear. Let's get this out of the way before we go any farther. The number one uh, misconception that, that comes up when I talk about discrete and continuous is when people see continuous, they think, oh, it goes on continuously. So um, a continuous function is not a function that just goes on forever. Okay, You can have, um, you can have continuous functions that don't go on forever. And you can have discrete functions that do go on forever. Okay, so that's not what discrete and continuous is. Discrete and continuous relates to this idea that I was just talking about with tables. Okay, so, so a, for a continuous function, the input values can be any real number within. A given interval. Okay, that's what a continuous function means. So if I go back to these tables, right, is a table continuous? Can I use any real number within a given interval uh, for this function and get an output? Like, can I get an output for one and a half? I can. What's my output for one and a half? I don't have one. I don't have the data, right? I don't have any information for one and a half. I mean, I guess I could average the two values and find what's exactly in between them, but that's just a guess. That's not actually like um, uh, uh, specific information. I'm assuming a lot if I do that. I'm assuming that it's just linear in between. So I don't have any information for one and a half. I don't have any information for square root of two, right? I can't use square root of two as an input. I'm limited on what input values I can use for this function, okay? So a table is inherently, uh, it's not continuous. Uh, a table is what's considered to be discrete. Discrete means your input values are, limited within a given interval. So tables are a really good example of this because I only have a certain amount of information, right? I only have very specific input values. I only have data for very specific input values. So my input values are limited. In this case, they're limited to whole numbers inside this interval from one to four. Okay. What about an equation? Would an equation be considered discrete or continuous? Continuous. Why? 
Yeah, I can plug in any number and it's going to give me an output, right? I can plug in 1.5 to this and I'm going to get an output, right? If, or if, even if I think about this equation, right? I can plug in any number I want and I will get a valid output. So equations are inherently continuous. Now, let's be clear, right? That doesn't mean, or I guess, there's still this qualifier that, uh, that as long as I can plug in any input values that I want within a given interval, it's considered continuous. Because consider this function, consider this function. A to of x is equal to the square root of x. Can I plug in any number I want? No, I can't. What numbers can I not plug in? Negatives. Negatives. Right? I can't plug in negatives. You can't take the square root of negative number. Okay? So you might think, oh, that means it's not continuous. Well, what that does is it gives me an interval. My interval is zero to positive infinity. So notice how I'm not doing anything with negative numbers. I'm just focusing on positive numbers. So if I have that interval, if I have that given interval of zero to infinity, now can I plug in whatever number I want? Yeah, so it's still continuous, even though I have a limited uh, domain. Okay, remember, domain is all your possible input. I have a limited domain, or I, have, or I guess I have an interval of the domain. I have a, I have a given interval of my domain. Okay, um, so, so this is still continuous, even though I have a specific interval that I'm working with. Okay. So tables are discrete, equations are continuous. What about graphs? What about graphs? Well, graphs are interesting because you can actually represent a discrete function on the graph and you can represent a continuous function on a graph. You can represent both. So what would a discrete graph look like? What does a discrete graph look like? Yeah, give it a shot. Would it be a graph with points on it? Yeah, it's if I draw a graph of, of a discrete function, all I would have is points on the graph because that's all I have. I just have specific input values with their corresponding output values. I don't have anything in between, right? It doesn't have to be whole numbers, but but that's the idea of discrete is the fact that. I don't have any data for anything in between them. Okay. So um, conversely, what would a continuous graph look like? One with an arrow just continuously goes. Okay, so so careful. So, the arrow does not make it continuous because that just means it goes on forever, right? But I, for it to be continuous, it doesn't have to go on forever. What makes it continuous? It would be that you can still draw the entire line and not have the points, but you can tell on the graph what each part is representing. Yeah, I have a line instead of dots. Okay, because this represents that I can pick any x value I want and I will have an output for it. Okay. It doesn't have to go on forever because I can just I can have it limited to a given interval, to a specific interval from like A to B, right? But anywhere in that interval, I can pick whatever x value you want, and I will have an output for it. So a discrete graph is dots. A continuous graph is a line. Okay. okay, we are out of time. So part of your homework is going to be there's one there's we didn't get to the the word problem verbal description. So part of your homework is going to be to come up with a discrete function, like word problem, a discrete function, verbal problem, and a continuous function verbal problem. So pretty much find two real life quantities that depend on each other that is going to give you a discrete situation and one that's going to give you a continuous situation. And yeah, so once again, I will, and, and so I'll put that on your homework that I post on Moodle. All homework is is uh, is what what what's the word I'm looking for? Is submitted on Moodle, so you don't have to bring anything to class next Tuesday. Just submit it on Moodle. Okay.
Have a great day, guys. Thank you.